This is attributed to the school or the workshop of the artist Perugino. Uh, it's not a work that I had given a great deal of thought to because I thought essentially it was a minor painting. The real um, oddity of it is that you have St. Jerome kneeling here with the lion and the cardinal's hat that you usually see him shown with, his iconographic attributes, he's got the rock in his right hand for beating his breast in penitence, but then he gazes upward at a tree, and this is odd. We sometimes see Jerome gazing upward at a vision of the Trinity or the angel of the Last Judgment. Even more frequently in the paintings by Perugino and his circle, we see St. Jerome gazing upward at a crucifix hung in the tree in prayer, in devotion. But here, the saint gazed upward at nothing, just into the leaves of the tree. And so I presume this was just a kind of workshop pastiche, uh, something you see not infrequently, where a younger artist in the workshop copies a motif from a master's painting, in this case, the St. Jerome, but misunderstands that that Jerome and the crucifix in the tree are tied together. When uh, it was sent over for examination with an eye to cleaning it, we didn't expect to find much, but we thought that it was fundamentally a painting of circa 1500 in reasonably good shape, one that would benefit from cleaning. The examination involved several uh, very standard examination techniques. We looked at the painting in normal light with our eyes. Um, we looked at the painting in ultraviolet light um, to look at the different uh, fluorescence of overpaint, how much overpaint was there, how much was going to be need to be removed, varnish. Also under the microscope. And looking at it under the microscope, um, one of the first things that we did discover um, was in the tree, there were some gold rays um, that were coming out from um, a leaf. On the basis of those mysterious gold rays, we decided to do a more careful examination of the panel. Well, that's when we took an X radiograph of the painting. And the X radiograph did show, unfortunately, that there was a paint loss probably in about the exact area where the crucifix would have been. And the X-radiograph shows the big gap there in the tree, as well as losses at the right edge of the panel and then behind the head of the saint. Um, uh, and through the chest and the torso as right. well. And in the X-radiograph, the different materials that are in the painting show up as different colors, white to black, depending on the density of the material. So, for instance, in the tree, the loss is very difficult to see because the material that the restorer used to fill in the hole was very transparent to the X-ray radiation and so shows very, very gray, whereas in the chest and the arm and the torso of the figure of St. Jerome, it's very, very white because the restorer used lead white as the fill material to fill in the areas of lost paint. Um, so in the x-ray, you're seeing areas that are bright white, and you're seeing areas that are very gray. So it's very nice to look at the x-ray next to the painting so that you can see the, the comparison of um, the loss. And one of the things we frequently do is take the painting right in and look at it side by side with the x-ray on the light table. One of the other things that was odd about the loss in the tree is how clean it is. Um, you see most of the losses in the x-ray have these irregular margins and the lines curve and follow cracks, but this was um, very clean, almost as though someone took a chisel and chiseled that crucifix off of the surface of the panel. Um, which there were gouges in the wood which, as well. Which frankly is so exactly what it's happened. possibly exactly <laughs> what happened, yes. Um, and now we are faced with the question of what, what were we looking at here? Um, one of the interesting things, with the fact that there used to be a crucifix there, my opinion of the painting went up. It wasn't one of these mindless pastiches where the copyist or workshop artist made a mistake. So at that point, uh, I think that was when we turned to look at the painting in IR to see what else we could find out about it. Uh, infrared reflectography examination revealed a very cursory fluid underdrawing, mainly in the drapery in the hands of the figure and uh, the foot, the position of the toes were changed, um, which shows that the artist is actually making uh, decisions, concrete decisions as he was painting, right. um, as opposed to copying something else. Also those toes, as odd as they seem to us with this weirdly splayed big toe, um, slightly rubbery foot, this turns out to be a pretty common quirk of either Perugino or someone in his workshop. You see it in a good number of paintings. There was still the question of that gold ray and what had been there before. I thought that there should be a crucifix, but I started looking at this point 
to see if there are other versions of the Jerome story that might explain what the alternate possibilities were. I was actually looking for other paintings by Perugino and his circle, um, circa 1500. And in a folder of anonymous paintings of St. Jerome, I came across this great image of this very same painting as anonymous, but a photograph that had been taken, we're not sure exactly when, but sometime early in the 20th century. It was with some delight that I found in this photograph um, a very clear image uh, that there was indeed a crucifix up in that tree. So suddenly things were starting to come together really nicely. And this was at the same point um, where I was cleaning the painting, um, removing the discolored varnish and the old restoration um, and a very um, a lower layer of a, probably an old oil resin varnish um, that was kind of stuck into the interstices of the paint making it look very spotty. And one of the reasons why cleaning was a decision was to remove these discolored later additions that were kind of clouding the crispness of the original paint. Um, Unfortunately, at the same time that the art historical picture was getting better and better, Alexis was discovering that the condition of the paint underneath the old varnish was um, worse and worse. Worse and worse. Not as up to the uh, standards we were hoping. The point I am at now in the treatment, the painting has been cleaned. It has a new saturating, isolating, non-yellowing varnish, and all of the paint losses have been filled with a gesso putty to match the texture of the original paint and I'm currently doing an underpainting in egg tempera to block in the color for the final layer of glazing. Well, and here's where you get into the philosophy of conservation. To be honest, for a conservator, this is kind of the best case scenario. Here we have a large loss that's central to the interpretation of the image, but we have the original photograph in which I can look at to recreate it. Right. So it really is a best case scenario in which I have what the painting itself really looked like. And I can then copy that crucifix onto um, the painting with in-painting materials that are easily reversible, can be um, removed very quickly, um, and everything, like John said, would be documented and stated on the label. So it really is kind of best, it would have been best a much, case. It would have been a much trickier problem if I hadn't found a photograph of it in its original state and we just surmised from those gold rays that there must have been a crucifix up there like in all of these other paintings. But fortunately, in this case, we don't have to make decisions like that.